good morning to one and all on behalf of faculty of pharmacy ms dramaiya university of applied sciences i gauri nayar assistant professor department of pharmacology extend a warm welcome to all of you for the webinar session fever to treat or not to treat it's my privilege to introduce to you all our eminent speaker professor dr m k unnikrishnan professor dr m k unnikrishnan completed b pharm from bits pilani in 1978 and phd from mangalore university in 1997 he has published about 150 articles in peer reviewed journal and is a co inventor in four patents his multidisciplinary research interest include but it's not limited to drug discovery pharmacology evolutionary medicine cognition public health and education his collaboration with boston university school of public health usa Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute Melbourne Australia Baba Atomic Research Center Mumbai University of Southern Queensland Australia and School of Pharmacy University of Wyoming USA has resulted in well cited publications He is a member of Society of Evolutionary Medicine and Public Health USA and publishes in this nascent discipline Dr M K Unnikrishnan has also published articles in the Economic and Political Weekly healthy health policy and planning etc which discusses contemporary socio political problems in healthcare he also contributed book chapters in addition to journal articles in newspaper and popular magazines discussing healthcare issues with socio political relevance after 33 years of teaching in the manipal college of pharmaceutical sciences and 4 years at the national college of pharmacy koikot he is currently serving as a professor in ngs mips nite university since april 2021 i welcome you sir hello uh, oh i am sorry i did not mute unmute is there anything more why by way of formality or shall i start yes sir you can start okay so first i shall uh, share the screen okay are you able to see the screen yes sir okay so then thank you very much once again dr gauri nayar dr anbu dr Damodar, then uh, Dr. Satya, Dr. Madhav, and above all, and sir, the other, yeah. Uh, sir, can you make it big screen, like presentation? Big, oh, sure, sure, do that. Yeah. So these are the people uh, I have to thank before I begin, and uh, particularly, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Madhav, uh, whom I remember as a very sincere and extremely devoted, honest man. he was a year senior to me when i did my uh, m farm in bangalore now this topic uh, i should begin with a disclaimer uh, fever to treat or not to treat uh, i think uh, not many would agree with a lot of what i say which includes uh, doctors i have had a lot of problems at home trying to convince my wife uh, because the paracetamol is a necessary ingredient in any travel kit and i never take any medicines for myself i have tried to avoid medicines i have tried to impose these things on my family but doesn't always work anyway so let me start the talk by going to the first slide uh, i don't know if any of you have seen this man this man with his eye patch he is julius axelrod a nobel laureate and he is the one who identified paracetamol actually paracetamol was a metabolite of acetanilide and when acetanilide was uh, causing problems acetanilide and acetanilide they actually metabolize in the body to become paracetamol and it was axelrod who identified this process and uh, his publication c brody and one more person they are very famous papers paracetamol became a reality after that they stopped giving acetanilin and phenacetin after julius axelrod demonstrated that paracetamol is 
the real uh, valuable medicine and less toxic because estenalin and phenacetin are very toxic so the antipyretic usage has been very primitive you know salicylate was already there in melobark egypt assyria greek all these people try to quench fever at various points of time since millennia before us bayer launched aspirin first 1899 and in 1948 julius axelrod demonstrated the value of paracetamol and paracetamol has then ever since been one of the most important medicines known to everybody available everybody used by everybody prescribed by everybody self prescribed overused abused even used for suicide so it's one of the biggest uh, you know superstars of the pharma pharmacy and 40% of the caregivers believe that fever is harmful so uh, this is the reason why it is overused to such an extent and 12% of physicians believe that it causes brain damage 70% of the nurses and 30% of the physicians prescribe antipyretic note that 30% of physicians prescribe antipyretic so it's not all that universal as you think but every home every mother will have a stock of paracetamol or crocin syrup if they have a child now next slide is about what is possibly wrong with paracetamol not all of you think that paracetamol is harmless i think the otc status actually aggravates its overuse abuse irrational use and even grocery stores stock paracetamol travel is luggage starts with paracetamol every mother will be having a stock of paracetamol uh, syrups and tablets and all sorts of things but don't think it is all that harmless you know in ireland there were about 1452 cases of poisoning in a single year 1999 and 43 cases of temporary or permanent liver damage because of paracetamol only one year if you take the same proportion to be true in karnataka we must have around 20000 cases of paracetamol poisoning every year and more than 600 cases of liver damage because we are about 14 times big larger in population than ireland so you can quite Im- quite imagine how much is happening in india there are twen- there were 21 suicide attempts with paracetamol in thailand alone it's a small country in two years please remember i am not quoting these numbers from the newspaper or tiktok or facebook i am using these numbers from peer reviewed journals i am not using anything which is not subjected to peer review so please cross over check and identify if you if you find or come across any kind of error on my side please inform me don't hesitate because i want to correct myself i too might have made mistakes here and there now look at uh, the fever as such you know i don't know what ideas you have about fever the big problem about fever is that it's very common isn't it it's very very common the universality of fever suggests an evolutionary advantage i hope you understand what i mean by evolutionary advantage a selection pressure must have been there towards creatures which could develop fever in other words you find across phyla across species across genus everything you find even the dog has fever even the cat has a fever even the cow gets fever so if fever is so very universal it should have something uh, you know some beneficial effect that is what we should logically assume and uh, what is fever fever is nothing but the state of elevated core temperature which is a part of a defensive response to pathogen this is a It's only a part of the definition. The very def- big definition is I've cut it down. But please understand, this is the core issue: is that it is a part of a defensive response. It is not the pathogen that produces fever. 
it is the body's defense that produces fever the pathogen is a reason i agree but is not the cause direct cause a part of the acute phase response i i am sure you must have all heard about the acute phase response is the acute phase response is the way the body defenses begin to appear and protective responses appear in the form of illness for good reason i'll come to that later it involves the secretion of pyrogenic cytokines cytokines that can generate fever and the temperature rarely exceeds 41 degrees that's the highest possible fever and it generally does not produce harm this is from the archives of internal medicine 2000 by placen it's a very very important journal and you can take these words for valid it is very different from unregulated hypothermia i agree that temperature rise is very dangerous it's critically dangerous it can be killing that's what happens when people die of heat stroke walking in the desert without a shade without water the body heats up and the body heats up from external reason but fever is the heating up for internal reasons driven by the body controlled by the body and remember that fever is a controlled response it is not an uncontrolled response i'll come to it in the next few slides the pyrogenic cytokines are not involved in the heat stroke and hypothermia and uh, of course many people argue that antipyretics are good and one major reason they say is because children especially 3 months to 5 years very frequently suffer from seizures but the funny thing is that the seizures occur at a temperature below 39 degrees and it is also surprising that people who get temperatures above 39 much higher temperature 40 they don't suffer seizures so seizures is something independent of the temperature at least the intensity of fever so there must be something else that is operating but mostly papers predict i mean have uh, demonstrated that antipyretics do not protect from the recurrence of febrile seizures so the only excuse to give antipyretics to children is to prevent the seizures which they believe causes brain damage but many studies have demonstrated that antipyretics do not protect recurrence of febrile seizures so there is very little point in preventing this through antipyretics and there is another argument they say that the cardiac and pulmonary patients are susceptible to the increased metabolic demand of fever now i think all of you must know this and i think you already know that fever is a very metabolically intense very metabolically intense reaction see the body when it warms up it requires a lot of energy you know i i recently read a article that you know the body heats up the bat you know bat is a mammal you know that isn't it the bat the cheetah when the cheetah runs very quickly the body heats up in the same way the metabolic rise the rise in the metabolic turnover of the body increases the temperature and they say that weak patients cardiac and pulmonary patients are susceptible to this hike in metabolic demand and that is the reason to give them antipyretics they are given unfortunately there aren't any good risk benefit studies on this aspect probably there are but i have not seen these papers yet fever has a very high metabolic cost very true it is because the uh, high metabolic cost could offset the physiological benefit that people want antipyretics it they think that the high metabolic cost will be more dangerous than the physiological benefit from the rise in temperature this is the argument but there has been no evidence in support of these people who argue for uh, 
uh, you know, bringing down the metabolic uh, turnover. Now, going to the next slide, I think you should know what fever is and how it happens. The same, the archives in Internal Medicine 2000 will give you this uh, very clear account on this. Please read that paper. It's a brilliant paper. The pyrogenic cytokines induce COX-2, cyclooxygenase 2. And the cyclooxygenase 2 induced arachidonic cascade is what produces the PGE2. The PGE2 synthesis in the vascular endothelium of the hypothalamus is responsible for the resetting of the thermoregulatory center in the pre-optic area of the hypothalamus. And the PGE2 is responsible for raising the thermal set point, the thermostat, because these neurons send impulses to increase the generation of heat and reduce the dispersal of it. That's why you, you, know, you feel cold. When you feel cold, what happens? You start covering yourself. When you cover yourself, the body's heat is retained. It warms up your body further. The reason that you feel cold is also a protective response. It is, so, it is to help you to feel the fever, to raise the fever even better so that the body warms up even more. Now, but what's the purpose of warming up the body? We shall come to it. Antibiotics block multiple points in thermogenesis. There are multiple points of thermogenesis. Now, they say that also this COX-3 is a variant of COX-1 and that is especially sensitive to acetaminophen. That's the reason they say for uh, this acetaminophen producing very efficient antipyretics. Now, uh, if uh, antipyretics are bad, what about external cooling? Lots of external cooling practices are even today very much in demand. Ice pack. Cooling blankets are available. Cooling blankets. Cooling blankets induced wide temperature fluctuations and there are episodes of hypothermia when you use cooling blankets. And cooling can also produce vasospasm which can even worsen the heat loss. That's another problem. Antipyretics cause coronary vasoconstriction and it can be bad for the cardiac patient. So the benefit from suppressing the extra metabolic demand by antipyretics can probably work against the cardiac patient because of vasoconstriction. So you have to look at multiple components of illness if you want to understand the need for cure. Now, high fever means serious infection. In fact, there are many studies uh, which have uh, demonstrated the value of uh, in serious you know, in fact, they say that, uh, you know, uh, mothers, I'm sure, are familiar with these things. When the children get very high fever, even paracetamol sometimes fails to bring it down, isn't it? You give him one, the fever is not subsiding. Give him another, it's still not subsiding. So what does it mean? The antipyretics are unable to suppress the fever response in the person. The reason is the infection has been so intense that the body is unable to, you know, bring down the temperature. The body is trying all its effect, all its impact is being felt on the thermogenesis center. And no, and this has been demonstrated in bacteremic fever. The, when there is bacteremia, you know that bacteremia is a very dangerous condition. Bacteremic fevers respond better to paracetamol than, the non-bacteremic fevers respond better to paracetamol than bacteremic fevers. Meaning to say, non-bacteremic fevers, I hope you know, you know what bacteremia is. Bacteremia is bacteria in the blood. But blood is normally sterile. If there are bacteria swimming in the blood, that means you're terribly infected. Your defense is extremely bad. In such situations, when there is bacteremia, the temperature is so high, paracetamol is unable to bring down the temperature. Whereas in non-bacteremic conditions, paracetamol is efficient. However, there have been six studies 
and uh, only one or two have been able to show that uh, paracetamol is better in non-bacteremic fevers. There are many studies, but th this is not a very well-founded argument. But I can tell you that there is such a condition. Neoplastic fevers respond better to NSAIDs. I know I don't know whether you know about neoplastic fevers. When you develop cancer, one of the early symptoms is temperature, body temperature rises. And if it is a neoplastic fever, it's different from an infective fever. Neoplastic fevers respond much better to NSAIDs. In fact, they say this is even a good diagnosis. You give them a paracetamol and see if it quickly comes down, that means it's likely to be cancer. The temperature up, uh, the high rise in temperature is possibly because of a cancer more than an infectious agent. This has been again subject to some kind of study. Now, I am not saying no antibiotics at all, certainly not. Antibiotics are important for patient comfort, but it's justified only if there is a reason. Because comfort is not the purpose of the body, remember. Why do you feel pain? You know, let's look at it. Why do you feel pain when you cut your finger? Why do you feel pain when you stand for a long time? If you don't feel pain, you will neglect your leg, your knee. And then what happens? Your knee slowly gets injured, worn and torn. And eventually you'll never be able to walk. Your, your leg will become dysfunctional if you don't feel pain. If your hand is cut and if you don't feel pain, you will neglect your wound. You will stop. You know, one of the major aspects of repair is immobilization. If there's an injury, injured part of it, first thing you do is you don't move that part, isn't it? That's why the fracture requires an immediate plaster cast because even the slightest motion works against the repair of bones. So comfort is not the purpose of life. Remember that. Survival is the purpose of life. Comfort can be sacrificed if survival is under threat. You understand? I'll give you another story. Now, suppose uh, you fall down from the scooter and have an accident. You break, let's say, you break your leg. God forbid, say nothing such, such, such should happen. But imagine on those Bangalore roads, you do see this happening sometimes. A person falls down, let's say, from the on the road and breaks his leg. His first instinct will be to just move away from the road because so many traffic, so many uh, buses and cars are coming this and way and that. So he will not feel pain first after a major injury. He will drag himself to the side of the footpath and then he'll suddenly find, oh my God, my leg is broken. And the pain immediately sets in. He's unable to move his leg. So for that brief period, till his escape is guaranteed, the pain is not as important as survival. So to survive, you do, should not have pain. So pain is suppressed. That's why you have endorphins. But the moment you have reached security zone on the footpath, your pain returns because now it is not comfort that is required. It's not movement that's required. It's immobility that's required to heal the fracture. So in, in every manner, your body has been blessed with the finest defenses. But remember, comfort is not the purpose. Pain relief is not the purpose, not always the purpose. But there are situations I fully appreciate when you have an examination, you have to attend an interview or travel somewhere far and you have a severe fever, your air ticket is booked, you cannot change the date, you cannot cancel the trip. You have to go and meet your grandfather. He's calling you on from his deathbed. I mean, there are certain situations when you cannot avoid it. So in such situations, take a paracetamol. Go. That's okay. Okay. Now, do you know this COVID time, paracetamol was uh, such a problem because paracetamol was masking the symptoms. Many COVID cases were able to walk free because the temperature sensors were unable to catch, catch them. You know, that's another side to uh, suppressing fever. There are so many aspects of it. See, this is a very big chapter. I mean, it, it will require many, many days to discuss it fully. But understand one very important point.
the body is not designed for comfort the body is designed for survival the body can sacrifice comfort if survival is under threat and that's the reason why i would say antipyretics may be used only when the need is high antipyretics can hurt that the reason is that you know it has been observed the crusting time you know the the lesions on the skin those little uh, pustules that form upon the skin they dry and form crust and this crusting process will delay if you take paracetamol viral shedding increases the nasal symptoms increases with paracetamol it prolongs the parasitemia in falciparum malaria if you have malaria and if you take uh, paracetamol and antipyretics it will increase the parasite load in the body by reducing tnf alpha and the oxygen free radical formation so there are many many reasons against the universal misuse of antibiotics i would put it that now there is another interesting thing about uh, you know the uh, acute phase reaction now the complex physiological response to disease and the cytokine mediated rise in core temperature as part of the acute phase reaction and the activation of physiological endocrine and immunological systems all these facts are only mentioned in the passing when you pass when you do your graduation there are many articles studying the information level in doctors and they agree that the physicians are not taught they are under informed about the febrile response and that's one of the reasons why paracetamol is universally prescribed without considering its possible value in a given patient in a given situation in a given illness and i'm coming to it and you will learn by and by that uh, it could do a lot more harm than you can imagine i'm coming to it slowly i hope you understand you can stop me and ask me and if there's any question and i hope i am audible and my slides are visible now there's a very recent paper which uh, really inspired me to give this talk and that is by uh, vorotech and it was published very recently this year you know and that was an exhaustive very thorough coverage on fever and its title let fever do its job that was the title of the paper a very scholarly paper very exhaustive please read it you will be a changed person i'm telling you you will learn to respect life as it is and challenge the wisdom of man in many situations we go wrong now what he says is that this fever is not just a mammalian instinct even the invertebrates and poikilothermic vertebrates raise body temperature sometimes behaviorally what a fantastic observation poikilothermic vertebrates what i mean by poikilothermy is like the frog let's say or the snake they are vertebrates but they don't they are not endothermic there is no endothermy endothermy is the ability to produce warmth from inside no just recently i re i read a paper on the mitochondria you know they they did a study on the cell which part of the cell is the hottest and they found that the micro mitochondria might be 50 degrees centigrade the temperature in the mitochondria the reason is all the energy is produced from there the heating the burning is going on there no so this uh, why i am talking about this is that the poikilothermic vertebrates also have a system despite lacking the instinct for endothermy producing heat from within by behaviorally altering its temperature during an infection i think there is some noise Patho pathogens uh, i think it would be good if somebody uh, mutes the phone i can hear some noise i find one very interesting thing here and i think you should all read that paper the pathogens are adapted to the temperature of the host this is the punch line today actually 
Now remember, the let's take COVID for instance. COVID attacks in humans or is successfully able to invade and multiply inside the human cell. The reason is that the COVID viruses are absolutely well adapted to multiply in the temperature of the human being. That is 37 degrees, 37 point something. Only pathogens that are adapted to the temperature of the host is, are successful in multiplying themselves successfully to produce an infection. And the purpose of the pathogen is just one. It has to multiply, procreate, continue, infect, reinfect, and the cycle must repeat. So this situation where pathogens attack hosts when adapted to their body temperature makes it very important for us to keep the temperature high so that we are not infected further or the infection subsides. The multiplication does not happen. That's also the reason why the fungi do not infect mammals and birds easily. Of course, you might have all heard of the black fungus and things like that during COVID. That's because of immunocompromisation. When your immunity is compromised, it happens, not otherwise. Otherwise, fungus will not produce systemic infections. End up inside infections are very, very on the superficial skin you might get. Again, it's got something to do with the temperature regulation. Okay. And the fungi also likewise do not infect birds for the same reason. Birds are also very warm blooded. Okay. Now, if you look at it, the next slide. I can hear a lot of noise. Is there some reason? Anyway, it's very disturbing. That's all. If somebody can prevent it, I'll be grateful. Now, let me come to this. Uh, we will uh, check it. Yeah. Let me come to this fever uh, and immune function. This is again a very, very important part of uh, today's lesson. It's about how fever enhances the immune cell function. In fact, this is absolutely amazing. You know, it's only when your temperature is high, the motility of the immune cells, the phagocytosis level, the reactive oxygen species manufactured by these immune cells, that is the neutrophils and the monocytes, all this is optimized only when the temperature is high. The natural killer cells are activated. The dendritic cells become active. The T helper cells become active. The antibody producing cells become active. All this activation occurs at the high temperature. In other words, as I said, this temperature regulation is critical to the defense of the host. And that is what we are suppressing. So what we are doing by giving paracetamol is at least partly, suppressing our fight against the pathogen. Okay. Fever enhances type 1 interferon. This is another finding. Uh, in fact, there's a very recent paper on COVID also. Whenever the COVID cases were very, very severe, they found that the type 1 interferon levels were low. And fever is the one that increases the interferon levels, the secretion of type 1 interferon is enhanced in the presence of fever, not its absence. In other words, the fever induced secretion of type 1 interferon is probably helpful in COVID-19 and those who suffered severe COVID had all of them a reduced level of type 1 interferon. So what does it mean? If you give paracetamol to the COVID patient, there is a chance that his immune system will be suppressed. Okay. And that could also be the reason why the in infection flares up. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm just guessing. I have no idea, really. I can't really say much. Now, uh, there are many, many other points discussed by this. I shall go through a few more. 
the fever destroys rapidly dividing pathogens now i want you to understand one thing you know the cell cycle the entire process of cell division is extremely well managed and uh, controlled with great precision you know you must be knowing that the cell cycle is a very complex uh, phenomenon with multiple factors coming in the way and uh, the rapidly rapidly dividing pathogens are the ones which find it most difficult to multiply that uh, you know divide and spread and that's because as i told you the pathogen is adapted to the normal temperature its multiplication is easy only when it is not producing a fever at the normal temperature of man see remember there's one uh, eternal conflict between the pathogen and the host this conflict continues forever it's an evolutionary struggle across time and there's another thing very interesting <coughs> the pathogens are also under stress from iron deprivation it's been found that when uh, when you suffer fever especially tuberculosis and all that even the iron levels come down iron deficiency anemia iron deficiency anemia i'll not say De- iron deficiency is observed in people who have chronic ailments infections in tuberculosis patients it was once found that they suffered they, i mean they used to observe that many of them are anemic because of iron deficiency and they started giving iron supplementation to them and you know what happened the tuberculosis flared up the reason is that this body is deliberately bringing down the iron content because that iron is used by the tuberculosis bacteria for multiplication that iron that is required for the pathogen you know is what is being robbed by uh, this uh, you know the protective phenomenon so protective phenomenon it creates an artificial scarcity of iron which hurts the host all right but i am ready to suffer that's what i told you comfort is not the priority Sur- survival is the priority so the body is willing to suffer but i w- it will kill the dividing cells that tuberculosis cannot divide in the absence of iron so you can imagine how vengefully it attacks the how uh, you know how full of vengeance the body is for the pathogen and what a great nature you know it is i am sure you have appreciate the, uh, the the very details of all this there's a lot to read and fever boosts the host, host immunity and increases the stress on pathogens which work synergistically to bring down the infection so the body i told you is not for comfort somehow survive to hell with comfort okay isn't it so fever tolerant pathogens out competed by strains optimized for normal body temperature this is the uh, principle of uh, competition between uh, many organisms suppose remember it just imagine if there are two types of covid viruses now tell me which virus will survive one virus is adapted to the normal temperature of the host that is 37 degrees one virus is adapted to a high temperature of the host which will survive you tell me can somebody tell me which will be more successful in spreading quite obviously it will be the virus that is adapted to the normal body temperature why because most of the population are at normal temperature so you'll find lot of victims in a crowd you go there'll be one person with fever but 90 people without fever so the virus can easily spread into people at normal temperature only those viruses which can spread at normal temperature will survive the others will die because it has to look for that one person with fever and by the time it has reached there the virus is dead so that's the reason there is a preferential survival of fever intolerant pathogens pathogens normally adjusted to normal temperature that's the reason why it widens the difference between growth in infected versus transmission to new host 
these are all evolutionary principles it widens the differences between growth in the infected host and transmission to new host very interesting principles i'm going a little deep but please reflect on this when you go back read this paper so fever adapted pathogens pay a, pay a fitness cost at the normal host body temperature it's called the life history theory in evolution please read this yeah? that's a reason why the phylogenetic distribution of fever is so universal and its evolutionary persistence as a host strategy continues to this day starting from uh, eternity i mean you know uh, primordial time so please understand the temperature regulation now um, before that let me go a step backwards there are certain constants in the body which cannot be violated like your body ph your blood ph that is your electrolyte balance the sodium levels the potassium levels etc the calcium levels there's no no question of allowing these to fluctuate you you would have observed that isn't it if the body temperature sorry the body ph rises by a, a little here and there it will completely destroy the body you will die the same thing applies to temperature temperature is also especially the warm blooded creature the temperature must be regulated see the primitive organisms have this flexibility of adapting to different temperatures by hibernation and things like that that's why a crocodile can lie in the snow for you know months and then come back later but that's some kind of a sleep that it gets anyway i'm going to a little digression let me not uh, waste time on this now there's a wide phylogenetic distribution of fever so please understand the evolutionary basis of fever and its persistence as a host strategy is a very important for you now that's why the fever adapted i already discussed this yeah yeah now uh, another interesting thing is i you i you would have heard the story that the covid-19 virus came from the bats okay and the bats don't fall sick you know that the bats are perfectly okay that's why they are able to fly long distances and give the illness to us and go back that is because they say that the bat can uh, raise its body temperature to 40 degrees when it flies at a, i told you when there's extreme metabolic uh, a turnover the body temperature rises when the body temperature rises to 40 when the bats fly so the constant change in the body temperature is confusing to the virus or bacteria the pathogen that enters the bat is it can probably survive but it cannot multiply very vigorously and cause infection that's the reason why bat doesn't get infected by many viruses that it carries it carries hundreds of different viruses and that's also the reason why bat is feared by everybody because it can transfer nipa it can transfer this that and the other hundreds of bat infested bat transmitted viral infections are known to man as you know all and these are issues which you should understand again i think i am repeating this class so these are the major misconceptions to sum it up fever is harmful and it's caused directly by the pathogen and the infection no fever is body's response to febrile seizures are frightening yes but there's no evidence that antipyretics will prevent febrile seizures now you know one thing i don't know whether you have heard of this fever has also been used to treat illnesses in fact uh, the picture here it's wagner yorick he won the nobel prize in 1927 he's watching transfusion from a malaria patient to a neurosyphilis victim they used to inject malaria parasite to people suffering from neurosyphilis to kill the syphilis germ malarial parasite was injected to produce a fever so when you produce the fever the fever will kill the neurosyphilis not that ba- malarial parasite will go and kill the syphilis uh, germ no the malarial parasite will produce the uh, this thing fever and that fever will kill syphilis this is a, a picture in 1934 taken from the past and remember it was a very very uh, successful treatment method in those days that's why you got the nobel prize okay so quite imagine uh, how 
things work, it's so very puzzling to us. In fact, cancer also can be suppressed by fever. Here is an example. There's something called local hypothermia, where the heat is uh, focused on the cancerous tissue. By raising the temperature, the division of cells in the cancerous tissue is suppressed. Because cell division, again, I told you, is sensitive to temperature. That's also the reason why many cancer patients suffer this uh, high temperature. They have this fever response when they have cancer. Here is an equipment that's used to treat head and neck cancer by localized warming. It's a kind of, a, it's called the local hypothermia induction for head and neck cancer. It's an example. Now, it's been also studied in uh, cases of sepsis. Uh, as you know, sepsis is a very dangerous condition. And uh, they were found in Denmark and Sweden. They did two studies with about 2,000 patients. And they found that the death rate came down when the fever was high. That is, the highest fever had the best survival. And also, reducing the temperature increased the deaths in 269,000 ICU patients in New Zealand and Australia. I'm sorry, there's a mistake here. It's not just New Zealand, it's New Zealand and Australia together. In another study, in I think that was UK, not Australia. This, uh, this should be read as New Zealand, Australia. Similar study in, result in Australia, uh, this is not Australia, it's UK. About 366,000, that's around uh, 3.6 lakhs of uh, patients in ICU were observed, and they found that the temperature when was not when did not rise, the deaths were more. That is, people who had fever were more likely to survive. You know, even in COVID pneumonia cases, people who had fever more than 39 degrees had better survival. And knowing this fully well, people take paracetamol recklessly and people prescribe. But there are uh, studies which have challenged this. is not a conclusive study. There is a study which has challenged the study. So I don't know where that study is, but I read about it. But let's give benefit of doubt because the HEAT trial, critically ill patients did not have better survival to fever suppression with an at least one thing is sure, giving paracetamol does not improve the survival. So why not give it a chance? In an RCT in IC patient, ibuprofen did not improve survival. Some trials have shown harm from reducing body temperature. So in other words, one thing is certain. Increasing fever and survival, okay, if the, uh, if the proof is not certain, at least let's look at this trial, the heat trial. Reducing temperature with paracetamol does not help. It does not improve survival. This is mean a study. Now, okay, what about cooling? Again, uh, let's come back to cooling. There was a trial using chilled IV saline to induce hypothermia in meningitis. Thinking that fever is bad, they try to do this. I'm sorry, my reference has gone somewhere. I can't find it, but I can send it to you if you want. The trial was using chilled IV saline through infusion to induce hypothermia in meningitis. The trial had to be stopped in the middle. You know why? The interim review revealed that mortality increased when IV chilled saline was passed. Meaning to say, cooling the body is dangerous. An RCT on a mechanical cooling of critically ill patients with septic shock provided the same result. They had to stop the trial before time because of the higher mortality in the cooling group. The host parasite conflict is bitter, it's primitive, it's key to survival, and the struggle is even self destructive and vengeful. You know, in uh, there's a saying. I think it is in. I don't know. If there's there is a similar saying in Malaya uh, in Canada, in Tamil. Uh, in sorry, in Malayalam, there's a saying that you know, I don't mind even if my brother dies, but I want my sister-in-law to cry. You know, it's something like that. That's the way the 
body fights an infection the body fights an infection even at its own cost of comfort to hell with my own comfort but i have to get rid of this fellow so that is the manner in which uh, we fight infection what a lesson what a wonderful uh, lesson from life now uh, there is a very interesting uh, thing which i thought i should add is is a bit controversial so please be careful when you talk about this to people the, the, but these are recent uh, evidence is picking up babies given paracetamol between 12 to 18 months are eight times likely to be autistic that's the paper from schulz 2008 and 20 times to be autistic with regression i don't know whether you know about autism 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 is uh, the complete absence of uh, uh, social intelligence how to behave they may be very sharp in doing maths and painting and singing and all that but then they just don't know how to behave with each other so sometimes the autism doesn't set in early they develop normally but suddenly there's a regression that is a backward milestone and they become autistic and they found that see what they did is see actually autism started after paracetamol came into the market somewhere around 50s middle mid 50s is when paracetamol increased and if you see the graph this is the autism graph the incidence of autism has gone up after paracetamol became very popular now what uh, schulz provide is is a very interesting case schulz actually himself uh, he took up a phd very late in life because his son became an autistic case okay and uh, he wanted he wanted an answer to this question he was so upset by his son's autism he went and did a phd and he is the one who identified what he said is that he took up the case load of autism yearly case load and plotted against the year and he found that autism cases fell after paracetamol poisoning episode so when suddenly some years see if you read this carefully In 1977, warning labels were recommended for acetaminophen products. That is this. Suddenly, the number of autistic cases came down. Again, look at the sudden rise in 1980. Do you know what happened in 1980? Reyes syndrome was reported with aspirin, so people switched to paracetamol suddenly. so there was a sudden rise in the number of autistic cases okay this is very fascinating then murders in chicago in fact there was a report this is a murder in chicago they killed uh, people with uh, paracetamol which had cyanide uh, adulterated with cyanide and uh, this murder news picked up and there was a sudden drop in the use of paracetamol again there was a drop in autism similarly there was one more in new york one in chicago and another in new york both accompanied a fall in autism count so what are we learning from all this paracetamol could be behind the rise in autism all of you like appreciate that paracetamol i'm sorry autism is on the rise the number of autistic indians were very few possibly because we never accepted western medicine so easily we had our own native system but suddenly it's become very popular the consumption has increased could it be that paracetamol has created autism in fact there are many more papers i'll come to the next one there's a lot of bad news you know frequent paracetamol use and asthma this is come in a very top journal thorax then there's another paper association between paracetamol use in infancy and childhood uh, infancy and childhood and risk of asthma rhino conjunctivitis and eczema i am sorry i can't discuss these papers i am simply giving you the references that you can read up it's a 6 to 7 
years analysis from phase three of an Isaac program. And remember, this is in Lancet, please. They don't publish things without a proper inquiry. Okay. Now, uh, I don't know if you have heard of another story. MMR produced uh, autism. There was a big, but that was disproved. That MMR vaccination was behind autism. Now, there is an argument that people who took the MMR vaccine all took paracetamol. So it could be paracetamol, not the MMR, which actually produced the autistic children. So now this is a big, strong warning to all mothers. The babies, when they are small, it's better to consult a doctor. I, th I think you should read uh, the Mayo Clinic recommendations for... I think Stanford also has recommendations for pediatric fever and all that. Mothers, be careful. Huh? Your children are so precious. So I don't want to scare you. I'm not saying that paracetamol is a poison, avoid it and all that. But look at the amount of evidence mounting. You know, Autism and asthma has already been, uh, you know, medical hypothesis, then this thorax, uh, then uh, evidence that increased acetaminophen use in genetically vulnerable children appears to be a major cause of epidemics of autism, attention deficit. Again, see, so many papers. Restorative medicine. Prenatal paracetamol exposure and child neurodevelopment, a sibling control cohort study. This is again birth study. So the neurodevelopment is definitely under question. Not very conclusive, maybe. Acetaminophen use during pregnancy and behavioral problems and hyperkinetic disorders. JAMA. JAMA pediatrics. It's a very powerful journal. Prenatal and perinatal analgesic exposure and autism, an ecological link. Then, prenatal paracetamol exposure and child neurodevelopment. A sibling control. I think this was already in the previous one. So, beware, my friends. I would like to stop now. I think I have finished one hour nearly. This is all I have to say. I would like you to ask questions and uh, if you want to write to me, please do. I'll be glad to answer you. Give me some time. Of course, I may not be able to answer very promptly, but surely will uh, be a pleasure to talk to you or answer your questions. Um, and now I request uh, Dr. J. Anbu to propose the vote of thanks. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my dear colleagues participants and now we are parading now towards the end of the, today's webinar and it's my honor and privilege to conclude this session by extending a vote of thanks and uh, first of all we are uh, very much thankful to the management of Ramya University and uh, inspirational at the source uh, humble vice chancellor dr kk raina and uh, pvc's uh, dr karambi sir and uh, dr krishnamurthy jayana for their constant support and encouragement uh, for conducting uh, this kind of uh, webinars. On uh, behalf of all the faculty members of the Department of Pharmacology, I thank uh, our uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Madhavan sir and uh, the, our Dean Dr. S. Bharat for uh, their uh, continuous support and encouragement with their uh, proactiveness and uh, valuable guidance. And we are really fortunate to have an eminent speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Unni Krishnan sir. And in spite of his busy schedule, he agreed to deliver uh, this talk. And we are very much thankful to you, sir. And also, I would like to thank Mrs. Gauri Nair for identifying such a wonderful senior person for this program. And uh, uh, I would like to highlight some of the statements that he shared uh, during his uh, session. So he pointed out why uh, this uh, fever is uh, universal and uh, he mentioned about uh, the fever uh, is a part of our uh, defensive response and uh, he justified for uh, uh, prescribing uh, antipyretics and uh, he explained very well about uh, why the external uh, cooling, this external cooling is uh, dangerous and uh, also he mentioned something about uh, the neoplastic uh, fever it is a uh, new information for us and also in his uh, session he brief uh, briefed about uh, body is uh, designed for survival 
not for comfort uh, it is a very good written explanation on this particular point sir and uh, physicians are not uh, taught they are uh, under informed and uh, explained very well about uh, the job of the fever in our body by giving an uh, updated literature uh, and uh, it is uh, titled let fever do its job uh, and uh, very much uh, surprised to know that the temperature is at mito uh, in the uh, mitochondria in the uh, cell is about at uh, 50 degree centigrade and also the pathogens adapted to the temperature of at uh, their uh, host so uh, with all these kind of uh, information and uh, you really appreciate uh, about our fever um, so with uh, this i would like to uh, um, convey my sincere appreciation uh, to mr damodar nayak assistant professor and our department faculty members at name is sir satya and dr mohammad azmatullah for their support and the cooperation throughout the process and uh, arrangement uh, to successfully conduct this webinar and uh, on my personal behalf and on behalf of department of pharmacology so faculty of pharmacy um, i profusely thank all the participants of uh, this webinar and uh, uh, for their uh, active participation and support and presence in making this program a yeah, noteworthy success so thank you very much to one and all so i uh, once again i would like to thank our uh, uh, speaker for uh, sharing his knowledge so thank you very much sir so thank, thank you one you. and all thank you uh, is it all yeah. may i leave then y yes sir yes sir thank you, you can you. leave the session now thank so we will contact you sir thank you sir